Tonight we're in the Titanic Center in the docks of Belfast. Welcome to Question Time. And facing our audience tonight, the former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, one of five cabinet ministers to defy David Cameron and back the Leave campaign, Theresa Villers, Owen Smith, who quit the shadow cabinet last year to challenge Jeremy Corbyn for the Labour leadership, is now back in the fold as shadow Northern Ireland secretary, the director of elections for the DUP, who offered their support to Theresa May in return for £1 billion to be spent in Northern Ireland, Simon Hamilton, Sinn Féin's former education minister, John O'Dowd, and the film director, screenwriter, novelist, one of the creators of the BAFTA-winning comedies Yes, Minister, and Yes, Prime Minister, Jonathan Lynn. <laughs> Thank you very much. I shall keep what I say to a minimum tonight, because as you hear, I've got a slight sore throat. I apologise for it. One. Our first question, please, uh, from Sally Abernethy, please. Sally Abernethy. Uh, should abortion law in Northern Ireland be amended to reflect changing public attitudes? Yes, Northern Ireland uh, has abortion only if the mother's life is at risk, not in, for any other circumstances or endangers her health in the long term, uh, uh, making it unique in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, should it be changed? Um, you start, Simon Hamilton. Look, I think whenever we um, debate these issues uh, and talk about them in sort of realms of, of politics, we have a, a tendency per, perhaps to sometimes forget that we are dealing with real people and real issues, and that's a, an exceptionally sensitive issue that deserves the appropriate respect. Um, and look, Northern Ireland does have uh, a different set of abortion laws to the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, the fact that that persists is, is a reflection of many different things. It's a reflection I suppose, of the devolution settlement that we have, where you can have different parts of the United Kingdom taking different views to reflect uh, the views and the, the ethos of the, the people within that region of the United Kingdom. Uh, and there is a clear uh, difference of view in Northern Ireland versus perhaps uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, there isn't a, a single major party in Northern Ireland who supports the extension of the 1967 Act to Northern Ireland. Um, that is reflected then in any attempt that there has been uh, in the Northern Ireland Assembly and Northern Ireland Assembly when it has been up and running to amend the law, there has been a, a debate uh, where there has been cross-community support not to radically change or reform. What, what's the, uh, the DUP view of this? The DUP does not want to see the 1967 Act uh, extended to Northern Ireland. So you want to stay as things are? We, we, we want to stay in that. In the 1967 Act? It was the, the, the act that uh, allowed the liberalisation of abortion laws in, in the rest of the United Kingdom and Great Britain. Uh, so you know, I, the, the position that the DUP adopts, and I think it's a position that Sinn Féin and all the major parties at Stormont have adopted consistently, is that we shouldn't change the law. That reflects, I believe, the majority position. So you, you, in you sorry, put it to cut to the chase. You see it as a strength that in the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland can have a different view on this. Well, that, that reflects the, the devolutionary settlement that we have. Yeah, so, right. Scotland and Wales Dad, is that how you see it? different views. Well, there's certainly no desire in the Assembly parties for bringing in the 1967 Abortion Act, but there's certainly a desire in the Assembly, among, I think among cross uh, the Assembly parties, and the DUP is exception to that, and perhaps the Ulster Unionist Party as well, for a change to the current law. Uh, we certainly do believe that in, the, in circumstances such as rape, circumstances such as fatal fetal abnormalities, that termination should be available to, to women who choose that. Uh, we have circumstances here where perhaps thousands and thousands of women are leaving the island of Ireland in its entirety because our law across the island of Ireland uh, is very similar uh, to, to go to Britain for abortions. And those women are criminalised and in some sectors they're demonised. And that is completely wrong and unacceptable. So we do need to see a change in the law. Mm -hmm. okay. um, to, to, to Lisa Miller. Well, I've voted in support of the law as it stands in Great Britain. I fully accept that this is a matter which is rightly devolved and it's for the people of Northern Ireland to make that decision. But yes, I would like to see change. I think that there is a case for expanding access to abortion in Northern Ireland, but I fully recognise the sensitivities. And, but I think it's, 
it's high time there was more of a debate on this in Northern Ireland. Do you think, uh, you're, you, you represent a constituency in England, do you think people realise that on abortion, on the issue of gay marriage, for instance, Northern Ireland is a very different place? I, I think sort of many people in Great Britain wouldn't be aware of the differences in abortion law in Northern Ireland. And on gay marriage? I think on gay marriage there, there probably is slightly more of an awareness that there is a different law in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK. The, the, the woman there in spectacles, yes. Um, would the panel not say that for the people in Northern Ireland to actually have an opinion on this, we should be given a referendum like the South they're going to have? Uh, <clears throat> Well, I also respect devolution, and it's a devolved issue, but I believe that politicians have to show leadership, and the Labour Party's view is that the way in which we show leadership on this issue is to say what we believe, which is that we think reproductive rights should be extended and should be equal right across Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We said that at our last manifesto. We believe that women here in Northern Ireland should have exactly the same rights over their bodies. Uh, and over reproduction that they would enjoy in Great Britain. I was very proud that it was a Labour Party colleague of mine, Stella Creasy, who uh, got the government recently to announce that they would pay for uh, and allow the NHS in England to uh, and in Wales to treat uh, women uh, who travelled to, uh, to GB for abortion. But frankly, that's not good enough because we shouldn't have to uh, ship out, as John said, uh, women, they shouldn't have to leave their do, hometowns. Do you agree with hospitals. the speaker there that there should be a referendum in Northern Ireland? Well, I, I, I think Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, uh, has been very progressive in bringing forward the referendum that he promised in the South. I think that would be a good idea in the North. I think, in reality, the politicians are behind the people on this issue. Okay. And I think attitudes have changed. And if there were a referendum, I think you could well see a change in the law and abortion okay. extended to Northern Ireland. The, the woman, woman in Um, I was just interested to know, do you not think, though, that in pregnancy, both lives should actually be protected by law, given the fact that last year a research document published by the campaign Both Lives Matter has shown through um, statistical evidence that a um, plausible estimate, as upheld by the Advertising Standards Authority this year, um, 100,000 lives have been saved in Northern Ireland because of our pro-life laws? So you, you, the law as it is, is all right for you? you yeah. You yep. approve of abortion under the circumstances where it is allowed? Yes, yeah, it, under the circumstances. But you don't want it extended? No, no, no extension. All right, Jonathan then. Well, um, once again, I'm not sure that this is a politician's question. Um, it seems to me... <laughs> it, it seems to me that abortion is a private matter between the, the mother and the, and the father and the... Uh, I, I'm not sure why politicians are interfering in people's private lives at all. Um, I, I, in, in America, there's this huge... Dis I live in America. There's a big dispute between people who call themselves pro-choice pro and pro-life. And pro-life just means... Um, in reality, it means pro-birth, because they don't care about the mother or the child once the, once the baby's born. And, and I, I think there's an absolute lack of social conscience about what, what is the result of unwanted children being born. As far as I'm concerned, this is something that women should have the right to choose about. Uh, it's their bodies, they're pregnant, and it's up to them. Okay. Yeah, you said that. <laughs> um, so, you know, Simon quite rightly says that obviously all, all the parties in Northern Ireland don't necessarily want the act extended, but does that not beg the question at what point, if they can't? get it together enough to get a government together, does it not become their choice anymore? You know, if these decisions are devolved, but we're sitting in a situation where we don't have a devolved government, so at some point, somebody else is going to have to take responsibility for this. OK. And, and you're the only one. The woman here. Yes. Um, it was just a few years ago that the High Court ruled that Northern Ireland's abortion law was contrary to international human rights law. Now, while that was recently appealed, and the appeal was won, um, that still goes to show how significantly women in Northern Ireland are suffering. And this is a matter of public health care. Women in Northern Ireland can't be abandoned under the excuse of devolution. OK. <laughs> you have an answer, please. Well, it is a matter which the Assembly, in my opinion, needs to stand up and deal with. We have made 
and various parties have made commitments to very, very vulnerable women over a number of years, especially over this last number of years, and we now need to step up to the mark and make changes to the law that are required. We should not be criminalising anyone. It should be a health issue. It should not be a criminal law issue. Absolutely okay. right. We'll take one more point from the woman there. Yes. John O'Dowd said that thousands of women are going to England for an abortion. Because of the proposed um, uh, referendum in the South, they published figures today and said last year 43 women went to England for an abortion. So these figures are greatly exaggerated. OK. Right. Well, we'll, we'll move on. We've got many questions tonight. Uh, let's go on and take this question from Babette Gray, please. Babette Gray. Is Brexit a disaster in waiting for Northern Ireland? Is Brexit a disaster in waiting? Northern Ireland, of course, voted Remain. Uh, and Theresa Villas, you voted Leave. What's your view? I believe that Brexit is going to open up real opportunities for the United Kingdom as a whole, including Northern Ireland. I think the opportunities to trade with countries with whom we have no trade, ag trade agreements at the moment will make it much easier to do business around the world. I think as an independent country, again, able to make our own decisions on how we support our farmers, giving a lifeline to our fishermen, introducing an immigration system that has democratic consent. I think all of these are big positives. And those that predicted that we would sustain an immediate economic shock when we voted to leave the European Union, have been proved wrong. We have the lowest unemployment since 1975. There are three million more people in work than in 2010. We, are the work, we are, have the best record in Europe for foreign direct investment more than ever before. There are many opportunities ahead for Northern Ireland when we implement Brexit. <laughs> Is it, is it going well so far? <laughs> the economy is going well. The, the fundamentals of the economy are very strong. We've seen good news from companies like Google, like Nissan, like GSK, like AstraZeneca, like Apple, like Novo Bombardier. Nordisk, like Toyota, like Siemens and Rolls-Royce. All of these companies... Bombardier, he says, in Bombardier. my ear. The yeah. Bombardier, well, we come to Bombardier. Bombardier. The Bombardier issue is nothing to do okay. with no, that's all right. It's a completely okay. different issue. We may come to that anyway later on. Um, all right, Jonathan Lynn. Well, I, I really couldn't disagree more. I, I, I think that the Brexit was, uh, is, is a looming disaster. I, I think that uh, it, the campaign was meaningless. Uh, nobody on the Remain side, talked about what the real purpose of the EU was in its origins, which was to prevent war. Conrad Adenauer and General de Gaulle realised that, that for, you know, the, the previous 70 years, Britain, um, Europe had been involved in endless wars. And for the last 500 years, the great powers in Britain and in, in Europe have fought each other. And the purpose of the EU was to put everyone into a trade relationship so that war would stop, and that has been a success. There's been no war in Europe since 1945, and that's a very long time in terms of European history. I think that's the most important aspect of it, and that wasn't mentioned. I also think that, that the casual lies about 350 million being spent, you know, going on to Europe every week and then going to be spent on the health service, and all of, there was so much nonsense talked. Nobody actually voted on anything that was real. They just voted about... Now, a word, Brexit, or remain, or stay, or whatever, but I think what's got to happen is a second referendum when there are terms known so that people can actually vote on what is actually being proposed, which is not yet <laughs> happening. <coughs> yes, sir. I would like to know what Jonathan Lynn's definition of a war is, because the troubles raged on while Britain and the Irish Free State were members of the EU. So, <laughs> enough with that project fear lie that the EU prevents wars. The EU gets involved in wars, not just in Europe, but further abroad, in the Middle East and Africa and so on. OK, and you sir there. 
Northern Ireland really needs right now for any sort of a proper deal is strong leadership and for politicians to be doing their, their jobs that they're elected to do. And I think that in our recent time, there's never been a more important time that our politicians are doing that, and I'd like to see them step up to the plate. Owen Smith, do you think, I mean, the question Babette asked is whether Brexit's a disaster in waiting for Northern Ireland, not for the UK as a whole. Do you think it's a, specifically for Northern Ireland will be different from the effect on the UK as a whole? Yes, I do. I think Brexit, uh, Brexit represents a profound economic, social, political risk here in Northern Ireland. And the people of Northern Ireland understood that, which is why they voted against Brexit. You voted against Brexit. Uh, the border is obviously the most uh, pressing issue. Theresa Villiers was one of the people who, in arguing for Brexit, said that we'd be able to solve the, the border issue with technical fixes. Everybody now knows that isn't true. It will require a political settlement in order to deal with that issue of the border. And the border doesn't just represent the economic problems of all of that trade, that billion pounds a week of the trades back and forth across the border. It's actually about the politics of the border, the symbolism of the border. I'm afraid I think the gentleman who said the EU didn't help, the EU did help bring about greater harmony on the island of Ireland. It was one of the ways in which uh, people learned to work together. I've got no doubt about that. What should it's Northern Ireland do about this border? Well, I think the, well, I think Northern Ireland it seems to be holding the, everything up at the moment. Well, I think, well that's, that's the way in which it's been framed by the EU and the British government accepted that. I think it's a shame that we don't have the executive because we need a voice from Northern Ireland to speak to those particular problems. But ultimately, we will need to solve the issue in respect of the customs union because without that, we will have a hard border on the island of Ireland and that cannot be acceptable because the risks to peace and prosperity here will be too great. Okay, the woman there in the front. Hi, um, I'm a student at Queen's Belfast. Um, I was just wondering, post-Brexit, um, what when, when I decide to go and see, uh, find a job in maybe Dublin or I'm thinking of staying in the island, lower down Ireland, going to Dublin, how will that affect me when I'm looking for a job? Simon Hamilton, what do you think? Uh, well, on, on the issue that the... The, the, the chi raises. Yeah, uh, I think one of, the, one of the issues that's been discussed in negotiations, and I think it's a, a sign of how important the European Union and indeed the UK government view the issue of dealing with Northern Ireland and indeed the whole Irish border question that the common travel area is one of those issues, which is the mechanism that has allowed, even before the EU existed, for, for free movement across the border has been uh, to the forefront of negotiations and good progress has been made. And I welcome what Michelle Barnier and David Davis said today in respect of that, that there has been an advance in respect of that bit of the negotiations. But they're still not willing, I, and I, and still not willing to discuss Hang on a second. Well, they've well, been advanced, think, but they're still well, not willing well, to discuss I'm, I'm sorry, trade well, arrangements. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to you, when I, I listened to Michelle Barnier and what David Davis say, and they, they say that that issue has been advanced in the talks and good progress has been made. I, I, I don't think that that's the issue that is holding up progress. And look, Brexit undoubtedly, to go back to the original question, undoubtedly uh, poses challenges uh, to Northern Ireland, but one of those challenges does not involve Bombardier. And Owen Smith does a, a disservice uh, to the many workers from Bombardier who may be watching this programme this evening uh, to play politics with yeah, the well, issue. Yeah, well, maybe we'll come to that. I, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to deflect well, you from Bombardier. So, Let's not talk but, about Bombardier but, for a moment. But, 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 Let's we, just we, talk we, about we, the there, there are unique circumstances in Northern Ireland posed by the fact that we have a land border. Um, but what we don't want to see is in dealing with that land border, a border placed down the Irish Sea. Um, our biggest market outside of Northern Ireland for seals, 60% of all of the seals that is done in Northern Ireland goes to, the, to Great Britain, to the rest of the United Kingdom. We want to preserve that market and not put any barriers, uh, non-tariff barriers between ourselves and the rest of the so United Kingdom. you think Kingdom. there'll be no damage to Northern but Ireland? I, I think there are challenges, but I agree with Theresa. That challenges there are, there are is a funny politi political are, word. What does are, it mean? There are opportunities as well. But, but look, I, I think where, where Northern Ireland uh, is benefiting in these negotiations, difficult as they are, is that there is a great understanding in London and in Dublin and in Brussels about the unique situation that Northern Ireland has. Okay. We have been visited by Michel Barnier, by Giver Hofstad, by uh, any number of people from the European Union and from member states, and they all understand the Northern Ireland issue. And I don't think, and I, when I listen to them carefully, none of them want to do Northern Ireland any harm. So I think we have, we have people who are on our side okay. in the heart of the negotiation. I, I'll, come to, I'll, I'll come to you, John, in a moment. Let me just go to one or two other members of the audience up there on the top right. Yes. Well, one of the, one of the speakers earlier mentioned the fact that we don't have 
politicians at the moment scrutinising Brexit. And I argue with that because Lady Herman is a unionist and she is firmly anti-Brexit. And yesterday the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee met to discuss the land border issue. And I was aghast at Jim Shannon sitting beside Lady Herman saying that he's a glass full kind of person and that we should be positive about everything. Instead of being like Lady Herman and being astute about things and questioning things. What Lady you... Herman is a, you were yet yeah. lectured at Europe, um, on European law at Queen's University Belfast. When she was a lecturer there, she published a book on EEC law in Northern Ireland. I firmly respect her opinion All right, on just Brexit that, and she since she's not here, to. Just since she's not here, what, what's your view about what should happen and how Brexit should be organised uh, to, to do good for Northern Ireland or to do the least damage, depending on your view? I think there needs to be a solution sli like special status. I know the DUP would have a problem with that, that it makes, in their opinion, it makes Northern Ireland different to the rest of the UK. But in my opinion, the Good Friday Agreement also makes Northern Ireland slightly different to the other parts of, of the UK, but in a positive way. You can choose to have Irish citizenship if you're born in Northern Ireland, or British citizenship, or both, and that's a very positive thing, and that's something that I want maintained. Okay. The person in the thank you. second row from the back. The second row from the back, then. I don't see how it's actually possible to say whether it's going to be disastrous or not. No one has any idea what's going to happen, and negotiations are at complete deadlock. So I genuinely don't see how it's possible to predict what's going to go on from this point. Um, John O'Dowd. Well, well, that in itself suggests that it's going to be disastrous. When you're talking about an economy, not only on this island, but in, on, in Britain, and no one knows what's going to happen next, that's bad for the economy. I think it's ironic that we're sitting in the Titanic building, which commemorates the mighty ship, the Titanic, which was unsinkable. It sailed out of harbour and sunk. That's a wee bit like Brexit. Brexit is a disaster for the island of Ireland. Uh, and let, let, let me be clear, let me be clear. If the people of England and Wales wish to leave the European Union, I genuinely wish them well. That's their decision, but their decision is dragging this part of the island of Ireland out. It is going to damage the entire economy of the island of Ireland. And we need to have a step change in both in terms of the approach of the British government and the Irish government. Uh, it's welcome that the European Union leadership at this stage is defending the Good Friday Agreement, is defending the rights and entitlements of European citizens uh, who live here, and we'll see how that develops. But uh, the European Union has made a difference in terms of the peace and the conflict that was raging on the island of Ireland. The peace process, and it is a process, not an event, uh, removed the military infrastructure from the border. The European Union removed the customs and everything else that went around the border. So we don't have a border infrastructure on this island, and that has to be welcomed by everyone. But do you, do you share the DUP view that everything is going well uh, for Northern Ireland in the talks that are going on at the I, 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 I thought I had given a different view than the same. What do you make of the view, though, that, that David Davis says everything's no, the, going the, well? well uh, the... I was part of the executive team that engaged with David Davies along with Simon, uh, and I've been at some ludicrous meetings in my time. But those meetings were some of the most ludicrous meetings I've ever attended. We were being told stuff like Theresa's trying to tell us tonight, that everything will be swimmingly. It'll go well, don't worry about it. We'll be, look after you. And I actually said to him at one meeting, he says, David, I'm not sure what the diplomatic term is for I don't believe you, but I don't believe you. Theresa Villas. But the, the reality here is that both sides of this negotiation, which is underway, recognise how crucial it is to get this issue right. That's why, and we all know that the negotiations have got to a difficult point at the moment on all sorts of issues. Yet, as Simon has said, even in these circumstances, Michel Barnier has acknowledged that there has been progress on, in relation to the Irish border because the EU know that it is not in anyone's he interest to introduce that, unnecessary he divisions. He said there has been progress on the common travel arrangements. Yeah. And that yes. was agreed with the European Union, even when well, negotiating the Schengen Agreement. So that was always going well, to be agreed. Well, let's come on to the, the issue of the common travel area and the question yeah. asked by the member of the audience about working in Dublin. We've had a common travel area between Ireland and the United Kingdom for nearly a hundred years. For decades, we managed to do it without being members of the European Union. There is no reason 
why we cannot continue with that common travel area when we leave the European yes, Union. That, that's completely different from an agreement on a border, both the physical nature of that border and the economic nature of that border. Well, well, personally in grey there, let's just hear from you on the gangway there. I completely agree with uh, Ms Villers that Brexit does have opportunities, but do you not think that um, we can only reap those uh, rewards and opportunities if we have a government which is actually effective? And I mean, I've seen Boris Johnson and David Davis treat Brexit as if it's some f form of boxing match, and you know, it doesn't seem very mature. It certainly doesn't seem strong and stable. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I just don't think Theresa can, with all the best will in the world, argue that things are going well because we are seven months since Brexit was triggered. And I heard the press conference today. Yes, there was some politeness, as usual, from Michel Barnier, but the overall message was seven months have gone by and we haven't moved anywhere. We've had, what, four or five rounds well, of negotiations. We've not moved forward, really, on any of the thorniest issues, the money, and crucially for us here sat in Belfast, the issue of the border. And at the moment, nobody on the Conservative side, none of the Brexiteers, have come up with a good idea as to how we fix the border question. None of them. And that should tell us that they haven't got a clue how to do this. Owen was saying what I was just about to say. The lady at the back said, said how, how can I say it's a disaster? Well, or going to be a disaster. Well, we, the answer is that the, the referendum was 15 months ago. Article 50 was triggered, I don't know, six or seven months ago. And we've still got a government of people who haven't got the faintest idea of what their plan was or is. <laughs> Do you still want a second referendum? Do you well, want a second well, vote? I, look, uh, the Labour Party's policy is not to have a second referendum. Labour well, Party's Owen policy... Smith's policy. Uh, look, I said last summer that I thought it was uh, the most democratic and the most sensible thing we could do to give people a further chance once we knew how this was going to play out. I think the last seven months have shown that we didn't know then and we still don't know how it's going to play out. So I still think my position was intellectually... Uh, coherent. I don't see any appetite for a second referendum <coughs> is the truth. I don't see the country crying out for one. So I suspect Jonathan and I are, are voices in the wilderness on that. Uh, Maybe in Northern Ireland there's okay. a bit more interest in it. Uh, but Cable, elsewhere there doesn't seem to Vince be. Vince Cable is, is, uh, seems to be consistently arguing that uh, there needs to be a second referendum. Well, he's definitely a voice in the wilderness. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> David, yes, David. Uh, let's just say one or two more people. Then we'll move on. Yes. yes, just a point uh, that Mr Dow said about he doesn't care about what the English voted for or the Welsh voted for. I'd just like to remind them that it was a United Kingdom referendum. It's called democracy, Mr O'Dowd, so please support it. <laughs> <laughs> David, 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 this gentleman is. David. This gentleman is right, and, and it's forgotten by many people who, who perhaps didn't like the outcome of the referendum, uh, that the United Kingdom as a whole voted in the referendum, and the United Kingdom has voted as a whole to leave, and we will all leave together. Okay. Um, but, you know, I've heard a lot of talk here about erecting hard borders and putting uh, frontiers back up at the border between ourselves and the Irish Republic. You know, nobody is talking about putting up a hard border. It is, in fact, the only people, sorry, who are talking about putting up a hard border are those who are seeking to scaremonger and those on the European Union side. And I, and I agree with the one that negotiations aren't perhaps as a whole going well, but I think he and others would acknowledge that on the issues of Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole, progress has been made, perhaps uh, differentiating that from, from other parts the, of when negotiations. The, when, when the Taoiseach, let, that's, when that's hang, on second, hang on a second, when the Taoiseach said yesterday about a hard Brexit resulting in bureaucracy, customs posts, border guards, truck stops, dogs he talked well, about as well. Yeah. He was just saying, this is what will happen if it well, goes badly, but it's not going to go badly. Yeah. Or was he issuing a real warning well, that this is... If, if, that's what, if that's what happens, he will be the one who will be doing that. Because there is no one on the UK side who is saying that they're going to put up border posts uh, or watchtowers mm. well, well, or dogs and fences see, at the border. There is nobody. There is nobody in the UK your, side. Your, and if that policy, happens, it will be because of the EU who will do that. Your policies tell us that that's exactly what's going to happen. Nobody, because you're, nobody's you're leaving, John, John, you know, know nobody's, nobody's going, going to do point. that. You know nobody's going to do that. You're leaving an economic union. Let me just have a word. You're leaving an economic union. So on the island of Ireland, we have one single, by and large, economic union where uh, agri-foods, agriculture, all sorts of goods can cr up and down the island without any hindrance. Okay. Once you separate that economic union, you have to collect taxes. And that's where this is going. So you need someone to collect taxes. You need someone to ensure those taxes are being collected, those tariffs are being collected. And that means you need a border. OK, we'll take one or two... Hang on. One or two more members of the audience, then we'll go on to...
the other question we half raised. The man in the check shirt on the gangway and then you in white and the back row there, yes. Both in the back row, yes. Um, yeah, so no, uh, Simon said nobody's talking about hard border. The UK white paper and the Irish government paper on Brexit both said that uh, they don't want to see a hard border. They, uh, they both want to see this free movement of goods continuing. Um, so there has to be some movement from either side. Um, perhaps we should be talking about what sort of border we actually, we actually do you need. Think, do you think the talks have got stuck? Because it's been the, what, the, one of the three stumbling blocks to talking well, about trade. It's generally. interesting, Theresa mentioned Michel Barnier's progress on the border um, comment. Giver Hofstadt was in Belfast. He talked about uh, his being uh, horrified by the situation, how divided we still are here, right. despite the help that we've got from, from the EU. Um, so uh, overall, there's not progress. And overall, I think it's irresponsible for politicians to be saying, not considering uh, the options, including a border in the Irish Sea. OK. Let's, uh, let's go on. We, we, somebody mentioned Bombardier. Fiona Werner, can we just have your question, please? And let's just... Go to that for a moment. What would you say to Bombardier workers who've been abandoned by Westminster to secure a post-Brexit deal with the US? Um, yeah, I was interested by your question. Your idea is that uh, the, the government isn't defending Bombardier because it doesn't want to upset uh, the American administration. Is that right? Yes. Uh, I, I feel that there's been a, a deafening silence on our side. The, the Canadian Premier has got up and said, no more, we're not going to buy anything from Boeing. Uh, Mr. Trump has said America first, but we've heard nothing from Westminster to, in support of our own workers. Just a reminder that the, the Bombardier aircraft, the C series, has got a 300% tariff imposed on it uh, as a result of this. Um, John O'Dowd. Well, the thousands of workers who work for Bombardier and the thousands of workers who are in the supply chain to Bombardier have now experiencing what. Uh, free trade with the rest of the world looks like outside the European Union. Because Owen is right. Uh, America, the United States has been presented as the saviour of, of, of the British economy outside the European Union. And this is the sort of deeds you're going to have to do with America to trade with America. So uh, while we're doing everything within our collective power, and this is one of the issues that the local parties are united on, and we're doing everything within our collective power, to put pressure both on the Westminster government, on the United States and elsewhere. I am concerned that, that the questioner has got it right, that the British government, while they'll make noise about this, have their eye on a bigger uh, game or a bigger prize, and that's trade with America uh, after really? Brexit. So they're pulling their punches, let Bombardier go hang, that's what you're saying? Well, yeah, I think so. And if you even look at the numbers really? of people employed in England and, uh, and elsewhere in Britain by Boeing, that has to be a consideration for uh, the Tory government as well. All right, Theresa Willis. It's, it's absolutely not true that um, the allegation that the government isn't taking this seriously. The government is doing absolutely everything it possibly can to defend the workers at Bombardier and the brilliant work that they do. The Prime Minister has raised this with Donald Trump twice. We've had interventions from the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary, the <laughs> Chancellor, the Business Secretary, the Trade Secretary, the Northern Ireland Secretary. Response. In Parliament this week, the Business Secretary said that he was absolutely determined to win this fight. We will win this fight. These tariffs are completely unjustified. We need a united front from across the political parties and from across Northern Ireland as well, in defence of Bombardier. I am sure we will win this fight. Uh, Ern Smith. I, I... I was in Bombardier talking to the workers last week. I was with Bombardier workers yesterday. I was with the GMB representing Bombardier workers this afternoon talking about it. And they are saying that the government are letting them down. They are saying that Boeing is bullying Bombardier. And they are saying that they are being allowed to bully Bombardier by the American administration. That isn't me saying it, Theresa. It is the workers in Bombardier. Now, if Bombardier were to be lost to Northern Ireland, it would be a cataclysmic blow to our economy here. It's fully 10% of the entire GDP of Northern Ireland. And the government should be pulling out absolutely every stop. And what we have heard in frankness is a lot of warm words, a lot of rhetoric from the government. They don't think this is what we should be seeing from a trusted partner. What are they doing to really hold Boeing's feet to the fire? We have about four and a half billion pounds worth of expenditure every year with Boeing. It's a huge uh, customer 
uh, we are a huge customer rather for them. We should be doing what Trudeau has done on behalf of the Canadian and, and, workers and, and, I mean, and is standing it, is, up to them. Is it, do, you, do you believe the report that uh, the Bombardier plane was being offered at about a quarter of its actual price in the United States and that's why Bern acted? No, I don't. I think Boeing see that there is a, a, a threat because the C-Series is a terrific aircraft with fantastic innovative uh, technology developed here in Belfast and they don't want to happen to them what happened uh, when they left Airbus become such an important player in the marketplace. This is uh, Goliath trying to squash David and David Bombardier needs government to support it. We need our government in Westminster to do more than offer soft soap and warm words. They really need to stand mm -hmm. up. America is being put first by Donald Trump. We need to make sure that we put Belfast workers first. You sit up there. <laughs> Boeing is effectively trying to put Bombardier out of business. They're trying to yeah. eliminate mm. a competitor. That's right. That, that's what's behind this. OK. And, yeah. and you sit on the gangway. Yeah. Yes, um, as you might be aware of that the other day, um, the South got the go-ahead from Apple to make a multi-billion dollar investment. Meanwhile, up here, as Owen Smith pointed out, we're about to lose 10% of our GDP and about 2,000 jobs. With that in mind, how can you honestly say that Belfast can be a player in a global market without access to the single market or the customs union? John Jonathan. This whole, this whole question reminds me of some ancient history. Uh, there was a plane called Concord. It was a really great plane. It was a supersonic jet. It was the only one in the world. It was really good. And Boeing and Lockheed combined to pressure the US government to prevent Concorde being able to fly across the United States. As a result, Concorde never made its money back and was never considered a success in world aviation, although it was obviously one of the all-time great planes. It was a British and French creation and invention. And what's happening here is the same thing again. Exactly right. It's protectionism. Yeah. It's simply keeping, uh, a, 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 an, in this case, a Canadian-Irish plane out of the American marketplace and out of the, trying to keep it out of the world marketplace. And I think that the, the notion that Mrs May can have any effect on Donald Trump with this <laughs> uh, is, is quite, quite extraordinary. Um, nobody's had any effect on Donald Trump. He goes his own way. He does his own thing. He doesn't have any friends. Uh, he thrives on enemies. Uh, he doesn't make, mind making a few more enemies. Uh, I, I, I think to, to, to place Britain's or Belfast faith in an arrangement with you know, making Donald Trump do the right thing is a frankly absurd notion. So, what, if you were advising government, what would they do? What should they do? Well, I, 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 I agree with Owen. They, they should be the maximum pressure brought to bear on Boeing. Um, and and I, I don't know. I'm not a politician. And I don't have the, the, the figures at my disposal. If Britain really is a huge customer of Boeing Enormous. and has, has some uh, ability to do that, then that's what should be happening. Sa Simon Hamilton. Yeah, I don't think I, I probably don't have to remind anybody in the audience here, but maybe many of your... Your viewers won't appreciate the, the importance of Bombardier, or shorts as many of us still call it, to, to the Northern Ireland economy. The thousands of jobs that uh, it has provided over the years and still does today. My mother and father both worked in it at a time. Um, and it has been a, a real centre of innovation and creativity which has now manifested itself in the, the C-Series. And the gentleman over here is right that uh, what is happening is basically bullying. And uh, Boeing are trying to take out a much smaller rival. Uh, I, I don't agree that our government have done nothing on this issue. Um, the government have been engaged from the Prime Minister down to the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary and the Business Secretary and I'm been privy to the, the amount of uh, phone calls, meetings uh, that the Business Secretary has been doing on this. Uh, and I, I, I hear what has been said uh, by others and, and I, I don't think, and I mentioned it earlier, that I don't think that any of us here or anywhere should be trying to make political capital out of this. I met with Owen's uh, colleague Barry Gardner uh, just about a week and a half ago and we agreed that what we needed was a united front on this side of the Atlantic to take on right. what let, is let happening in the States. But, but in, in, in terms of what, what should be done, like I'm, I'm always very mindful uh, of getting into some trade war where there are no winners, in fact there may be other losers 
uh, in Northern Ireland or in the rest of the United Kingdom. There is always cost in cancelling contracts, never mind what it might do to our own, our own defence capability. But in saying all of that, if resolution cannot be found to this issue that ensures that the C-Series, not, not just the C-Series, but Bombardier stays in Belfast, then the government need to make it clear to the US administration and particularly to Boeing, that there will be consequences if successful resolution cannot be made. All right. To this well, now issue. Fiona, who asked <coughs> Fiona Werner, who asked the question, you've heard all with, these answers. What, with all due respect, Mr. Hamilton, you can have as many meetings as you like, you can make as many phone calls as you like, but it's action that needs to be taken. The Canadian Premier has come out and said quite categorically, right, if you if this isn't stopped, if these tariffs aren't taken off, then. Canada will not deal with Boeing. And, and with respect, that, that has made not a jot of difference to Donald Trump or to the Commerce Department in the States or indeed to Boeing. And I appreciate that if our own government was to say that, it may carry a bit more weight given the scale of the contracts that we have. But we have to be mindful of the potential consequences. But as I said before, if we cannot get a successful resolution to this where Boeing sees sense and back off, then our government do need to make it clear that there are serious, serious consequences. Fiona, what would you like to see happen? <laughs> Good question. I, I just think that... You're suddenly in charge. <laughs> <laughs> That's a frightening prospect. Um, I think that Donald Trump has got this America first attitude. I think it's about time that we, we said, well, in our case, Belfast first. What can we do for the... Let's put Bombardier first and do what we have to do to protect those workers. OK. <laughs> We're going to another question. This one from um, Jacqueline Gray, please. Jacqueline Gray. Uh, do the MLAs on the panel feel any sense of embarrassment over receiving full salaries while they have been effectively bickering like toddlers? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds as though we barely need to ask for the answer to that question. So the question is whether the members of the Legislative Assembly, uh, the Assembly having no um, government at the moment, whether they feel any embarrassment taking between them £371,000 a month, I think it is, in pay, when they're not actually doing anything. Um, all right, John O'Dowd, you start on this one. You heard what the audience feel. Yeah. I don't know whether you'll convince them it's right to take. How much I, I, do you I take a month? Well, How I'd much are you this. taking a month just so we get it? Clear? I, I, I'd, I'd say this. How and, much are you an taking? AML, an AMLA gets paid around forty-four thousand pound a year. Forty-eight thousand yeah, right. pound a year. And you're being paid now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I was bickering like a toddler, then I would agree with the audience. We are dealing with fundamental rights of citizens in terms of LGBT rights, and, you're, and we've had a conversation at the start of this meeting that there's a denial to equal marriage. In this society, we're dealing with that. I don't see that as being childish. Just explain for viewers uh, in Britain what it is that you want in order to get the government running right. again. We want, uh, 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 it's, it's part of it. We want to see a rights based society. We want to see the rights of the LGBT community protected. We want to see the rights of Irish language speakers protected. And your viewers in Wales are sitting now with a Welsh Language Act. Your viewers in Scotland are sitting with a Scottish Language Act. We are denied that here, where we have been facing significant financial scandals with allegations of corruption at the heart of government. We went to the electorate twice this year, uh, my party, on that mandate that we would seek to resolve those issues before the executive was formed, and we got a massive mandate for that. Now, can it continue where AMLAs are continuing to be paid? No. But let me be very clear about this. Unless the issues are resolved, and we end up with a rights-based society, there will not be a return to the executive. And in those circumstances, MLA's pay will stop. Uh, Simon Hamilton. Look, I, I'm as frustrated as everybody here is, and you can tell by the reaction just how frustrated people in Northern Ireland are, uh, that six months after um, an assembly election, uh, we are not uh, doing all of the job that we were elected to do. We are still, and John will agree with me, we are doing our job in respect of representing our constituents and doing constituency work uh, right across the country. But we aren't doing all of the job that people elected us to do, and we should be. Uh, my party was prepared to go back into the executive after the March Assembly election, 
we set no preconditions and we drew no red lines. Uh, and we would still go into government without having any preconditions met or any red lines met. So, you know, the, uh, we were debating Brexit earlier. We were debating the impact of the threat to Bombardier. And it is the worst possible time for Northern Ireland not to have a government of its own. And it is Sinn Féin's refusal to go into the executive uh, to elevate language issues, um, which are important and deserve respect, but to elevate those above issues in the health service, uh, in education, uh, to do with Brexit, to attracting jobs and bringing investment to Northern Ireland is simply wrong. Right. Uh, and, and I'm as frustrated as anybody else. But I do agree with John, and, and our parties are continuing to work away at trying to find a resolution uh, to the difficult but issues that we face. you don't feel embarrassed about taking well, the cash? I, don't, I, I agree with John that we, we absolutely, that is an unsustainable position. Uh, it needs to, it will it's come to an end if we cannot find resolution, but we will be working away, we've been working away today, working away all week, working away over the last number of months to find a resolution. It has been proved uh, impossible so far, but we will continue to build on, on the solid progress that we'll be making and try to bring right. back the government Jack that people in Northern Ireland want and need. Jacqueline Gray, what do you make of what they've said? It still sounds like toddlers bickering because one biggest of the, our biggest party says, well, it's the Emmons. And the other biggest party says, no, it's them. You're both still saying, we have been trying, but the, the other side, if you like, are putting barriers okay, in our way. Well, and and you, and do, no, let us speak. Um, for the vast majority of people, whenever you don't turn up for work, you don't get paid anymore. Um, The, the electorate understand that what you have to do is a difficult thing, but lots of us have a difficult day's work ahead of us, and we still turn up and do it. The vast majority of MLAs have not been turning up to Stormont since January, and therefore the work hasn't been done. And when, get back to work. Please get back to work and do the job. <laughs> John, John Adad said that if it couldn't be resolved, then the issue would resolve itself naturally. There would be no... Uh, assembly members, the assembly would be over. Would you like to see that? Or no, do you I wouldn't. I would like don't. to see. I, I am in favour of devolution, and I would like to see the people that we voted into the positions working for I am absolutely 100% certain that all of those assembly members want to get back to work. They want the executive to be functioning. I. You know, spent four years as Secretary of State. I worked day in, day out with these people. I was never in any doubt that they're motivated by public service. They want to make this, this place work. They want to make devolution work. It is, though, the case that some of the issues with which they are grappling are immensely difficult. Some of them, the, the, langu the language, the culture issues, have been a bone of contention for you know, hundreds of years. It's, it was never going to be easy to resolve these questions. I think you're right to be urging your politicians back to work, but I think that Northern Ireland can continue to be proud of the role its politicians have played in delivering the political settlement. <coughs> I believe they can get through this impasse as well. I believe they will find a way to get the executive up and running again, and I believe it's vital for the interests of Northern Ireland that they do. Okay. You, sir. S Simon Hamilton, you said there was no red line set. Um, no. From my understanding of the election, you basically said no Irish Language Act. I'm not an Irish speaker, but if you give Sinn Féin four lines of legislation saying Irish will be respected in law, that's, that's, that's part of the process. That's all they really need. OK, the woman there. In... <laughs> yeah, yes, you. Yes. We voted for an assembly. We are told that these negotiations are taking place, but they are taking place behind closed doors. Why can you not go back into the Assembly and let us see you debating these issues? <laughs> let us see you voting and settling these matters in a democratic way. Jo uh, jo uh, all right, Jonathan Lynn. Um, this, is a, this is tricky for me. I'm not a politician. I'm not Irish. I'm English and I live in America. <laughs> Uh, Did you so, the answer? so uh, it's, it's hard for me to understand why these things are such huge problems. It's hard for me to understand why um, equal rights for the LGBT community is, some, is a stumbling block. It's, it's hard for me 
to understand why, since the Welsh have their language and this, the Scots have... A, the, I don't understand the problem with saving an ancient language. I, I, I'm, I'm failing to understand why this is such a huge problem for the DUP. And come to just, just don't, don't talk too much because you have already given quite a long answer. But on that one point, saving an old language, what's but, your hostility to? You know, my, my party leader, the former first minister Arlene Foster, has said that um, the party, or the DUP, will be happy to legislate for, which is what Sinn Féin have been looking for, legislation in respect of the Irish language. We want to want to do that. Uh, we are content to do that. Um, but what we don't want to see is what some within the Irish language sector, and indeed supported by some in Sinn Féin, have wanted, which is a dynamic piece of Irish language legislation which seeks to elevate the Irish language over and above all other languages and cultures within Northern Ireland. That is not something that I think would be conducive to ensuring that we continue to build on the political progress that we've been making over okay, the last... Why can't that that's be the, discussed in the Assembly? The, well, I, I, that's a very good question. Man in, in spectacles I, I can, there. I can confirm oh, that for you uh, now. Uh, man, man there in spectacles. We're not and then you sit up there. Well, let's get, let's get back yeah. in and, and do I, the job. I think there's a solution. Okay, hold on. They're, they're, making, they're agreeing to get back in. to agree with... I think they've got done the deal. They've done the deal. John is... John isn't asking for anything that Simon's not prepared to, yes. prepared to win, so I think we should settle it here and now. <laughs> 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 Let's go. I think, <laughs> I, think, I think you are a politician. Yeah, well, you, were, diplomat, you observe diplomat. politicians yeah. so straight, much, up, straight up the storm. <laughs> the man in spectacles there. Don't you think that not having devolution government in Northern Ireland has undermined its position in the UK? Yeah. What do you think? Owen. Um, yes. Look, I, th I think paying politicians is never popular in any part of uh, any part of the world. But I would completely defend Simon and John and all of their colleagues in getting paid because a, it's not true that they're not doing their job. They're not doing the legislating bit at Stormont, but they are uh, representing their constituents. I see that every week uh, when I'm meeting with them, and they are, of course, crucially still debating. Uh, trying to put back together the executive and get the assembly up and running. It's, it must be incredibly frustrating for people who voted uh, to see a devolved assembly, not to know what's going on. I find it frustrating because we don't know exactly what's going on between the DUP and Sinn Féin in particular behind closed doors. But I tell you what, I am encouraged that there are uh, positive noises still coming out of those talks and I'm hopeful that we're going to see some resolution. I suspect if we were debating it all out in public in the assembly, we might not see resolution. You, sir, uh, in, with your hand in the air, in, bl in the blue jacket, yes. The, surely politics is the art of compromise. Surely politics is about a hell of a lot more than sitting in dark, smoke-filled rooms and carving something up between yourselves. We voted you in to do a job. We want you to see you do that job and do it now. <laughs> Not drag this out any longer. And the man in the white shirt there, I was going to call on you earlier, we didn't get to you. I, th I think it's um, reasonable to point out that the reason the Assembly was actually brought down in the first place was due to the lack of integrity and the respect that politicians have for ordinary people. The allegations <coughs> around RHI scandal and now the new allegations surrounding this, the current speaker, Robin Newton, just goes to show that the integrity within the DUP and the, the unionist um, leaders clearly shows that they do not believe that the Assembly and the people can be um, governed properly. OK, thank you very much. We've got a few minutes left. Let, let's leave, uh, leave the politics of Northern Ireland for a moment. Take this question from Naomi Moore, please. Naomi Moore. Does Harvey Weinstein deserve a second chance? Harvey Weinstein, does he deserve, as he said today, give me a second chance? Does he deserve a second chance? Jonathan Lynn. No. <laughs> it, it, go on. <laughs> I think... I think that's my... Well, you said you live answer. in America. And, I do, uh, yes. And, and I, you're in the... You're in the, the the show, you're in show business? I am, yes. And what do you, I, I what do you in, make of... I lived I mean, in this, L.A. for 20 years. What do you make of all the allegations that have come out uh, well, about him? Well, they appear uh, to be Is true. it part of a culture that that's, was there, is still there? What do you think? I, I don't know. I mean, um, 
I, I've, I think these are extraordinary allegations. I mean, we, it's not just about Hollywood. It's about the world in general. There was Jimmy Savile here, and, and, and there's Bill Cosby, of course, who's not part of the film business. And, and there's, there's all kinds of sexual harassment and sexual bullying in many corporations, not just the film business. Um, and this just seems to be a particularly egregious example of... of but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's unique to Hollywood, no. Theresa Villas. I, I wouldn't say he deserves a second chance. I think what is, his conduct has been repellent. This kind of abuse of power is completely unacceptable. And I think serious consideration needs to be given to whether the honour that he was given needs to be withdrawn. What do you think over there? I think there are situations like uh, Cliff Richard back a couple of years ago where he was accused um, and an allegation was brought against him and in the end they were unfound. So I think we have to be careful of um, labelling, pe labelling people as guilty before, you know, possibly goes through the courts. He has, yes, he has, he has said that he rejects the allegations of any criminal behaviour and that all, whatever happened was consensual is his position. Yes, the, the person there in the middle, yes. Um, I think we need to ask the question as well. Like, a lot of blame is placed on women. I think about 60 women have come forward about that, gentlemen. So why are you so hesitant to believe that? Why are you so hesitant to believe women? You know, there's so much emphasis placed on victim shaming. Donna Karen came out this week and placed blame on women wearing provocative outfits. You know, we need to ask ourselves the question, why are people putting women at shame? You know, and, uh, the, the victim is never at fault. Uh, what, never... Uh, what do you make of his... What do you make of his uh, asking for a second chance to be, in other words, to be forgiven? No. 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 Simple. Okay. No. Very briefly, Owen Smith, we have to be quick because we're coming to the end. I think it sounds like a classic case of a powerful man abusing women. Um, the volume of accusations seem to me to be pretty extraordinary. There's now a police investigation, as I understand it, both sides of the Atlantic. I agree with Theresa. If he is found guilty of any of those charges, then clearly his honour that he received uh, here in Great Britain should be stripped away from him. Simon Hamilton, I think, uh, briefly, if you yeah, I think one of the, the worst things I've heard this week is the, the defence being offered that this was somehow acceptable at a certain time, you know, that this was of, of an era. Uh, and, of course, this, this type of behaviour, the allegations have made, it was never acceptable behaviour. Uh, and I think if there is, if there is one uh, glimmer of hope in this whole episode, it's, it's the fact that so many brave women have come forward and said that they were victims. Uh, okay. and, I, and I hope that that can encourage other brave people to come forward and tell of the abuse that they are feeling and as, as others have said you know powerful people abusing their position John making or breaking careers last no, point to you answers, no um, and as Simon has said if it empowers other victims whether it's in the glamour and glitz of Hollywood or in everyday walk of life to come forward then I think that's one positive that comes out of this uh, but no he doesn't deserve a second chance okay well our time's up apologies for my voice all evening I haven't been driving you mad Next Thursday, question time is going to come from Dunstable. Uh, we've got the boss of Next, the, the retail store, Simon Wilson, on the panel there. Uh, the week after that, we're in Portsmouth, where we bring um, Jacob Rees-Mogg face-to-face with Alex Salmon. <laughs> so, that, <clears throat> so if you want to, if you want to live live, but thank you to our panel, thank you to all of you who came here to Belfast tonight for this edition of Question Time. Until next Thursday, good night. against a padded wall.